Welcome to this new session of IntelliQuest's The World's 100 Greatest Books, in which you'll become acquainted with the book that is considered the first successful English novel. The title of the book is Robinson Crusoe, and it was written in 1719 by the author Daniel Defoe, a man credited as one of the originators of realistic fiction. Robinson Crusoe is a landmark book in the history of literature, but it's also a favorite among children and adult readers who simply enjoy a good adventure story with a brave, resourceful hero. The full original title of the book is The Life and Strange, Surprising Adventures of Robinson Crusoe. When it was published, Robinson Crusoe was immediately hailed as a masterpiece of the age because it so fully expressed the 18th century theme of the power of the common man to triumph over his environment. This triumph rests not only in survival, but in the ability to organize, invent, and create, and maintain a viable structure for life, even in the most hostile and unlikely circumstances. The story is a testament to the human qualities of endurance, ingenuity, and industriousness. Robinson Crusoe begins as a man who is restless and dissatisfied with his quiet middle-class life, and longs for adventure. He disobeys his parents and sets out for sea, but his adventures at sea are always unlucky and finally he shipwrecked and cast ashore on a deserted island near Trinidad. He spends over 27 years on that island, creating a home for himself and manufacturing the simple tools and supplies he needs to survive. After many years completely alone, he acquires a companion, an Indian he rescues from cannibals and names Friday. After many more adventures with the cannibals, with pirates, with mutineers, Crusoe manages to escape the island. He returns to England where he finds he is now a wealthy man. During his long isolation on the island, Crusoe is involved in two desperate struggles. One is the struggle of physical survival, and the other is a spiritual struggle. He must reconcile himself to God's will, recognize the error of his ways, and establish a new and humble relationship with his Maker. Daniel Defoe was particularly attracted to the theme of divine providence, a theme that appears in all his fiction, but which is particularly strong in Robinson Crusoe. Crusoe is, in Defoe's mind, a man who has sinned. Because of those sins, he is punished by God, who arranges a set of events and circumstances that will bring on Crusoe's repentance. Once Crusoe does repent and accepts God's divine will, he is able to live in peace with his environment and his destiny. God brings him the resources he needs to survive and steps in to rescue him from a series of emergencies and near disasters. Crusoe experiences a resurrection of his faith, and it's this faith, as well as his own inventiveness, that enables him to survive. This theme of divine providence is especially apparent in the chapters of the book that take place on the island, where Crusoe reflects on his situation and his past and communes constantly with God, asking for his forgiveness and grace. It's this mixture of physical and psychological realism that established Daniel Defoe as a pioneer in 18th century fiction. The themes in Robinson Crusoe become recurrent themes in Defoe's work. He was fascinated with the difficulties of surviving in a world of modern economic forces. His heroes are always self-reliant individualists who express Defoe's middle-class values and who try to balance their individualism and practicality with submission to God. Crusoe is based on the real-life adventures of a Scottish sailor named Alexander Selkirk who was marooned for four years on an island called Juan Fernandez. Defoe obviously embellished the story and incorporated his own beliefs about providence and faith but he strives throughout the book to give it a tone of a true story. It's narrated in the first person by Crusoe. The better part of the book is the diary Crusoe kept on the island, and Defoe supplies lots of details that can be of no importance except to add realism. Defoe's somewhat factual approach to his fiction is probably due to the many years he spent as a journalist and non-fiction writer. These techniques and the excitement of the story itself combine to make the book enormously successful. It's still popular reading more than 250 years after it was published. The man who wrote this all-time classic was himself a resourceful individualist like his hero. He was a man of many interests and curiosities, and his life, too, was filled with adventure, although adventures of a very different kind than those of Robinson Crusoe. Daniel Defoe was born to a lower middle-class family on April 24, 1660 in London. His father was a tallow chandler, or candle merchant, and he was also a dissenter against the state religion, the Church of England. As a result, Daniel was sent to an academy run by dissenters, an excellent school in Newington Green. When he finished school, he considered being a Protestant minister, then decided to choose between a career in business or a political career as a dissenter. He opted for business, 
a decision that led to many disappointments later. At the beginning of his career, Defoe dealt in such products as hosiery, wine, and tobacco. It's believed that Defoe traveled in Europe between the years of 1680 and 1683, but the nature of these trips is unknown. When he was 24, he married Mary Tuffley, the daughter of a prosperous merchant who was also a dissenter. Two years later, Defoe joined a rebellion against King James II. Although three of his co-conspirators and former schoolmates were hanged, he escaped without punishment. At about this time, Defoe's business failed. The French, who were at war with England, captured his trading ships, and he made risky business investments that were unsuccessful. He was deeply in debt and plagued by lawsuits. Unable to pay his creditors, Defoe went bankrupt in 1662, but unlike many at the time, managed to avoid debtors' prison. He then experimented with many different areas of business, working as an accountant, a trustee, and then as owner of a brick and tile making business. The latter venture was successful and enabled him to pay off most of his debts. It's about this time that he began writing, chiefly about government affairs. In 1698, he published Essay on Projects, which presented his ideas on how to improve society and gained him renown as an author. Politically, Defoe now affiliated himself with the moderate Whig Party, and he supported the then current king, King William III. He wrote many political treatises, the most famous of which is the satirical True Born Englishman. It's a poem that attacked the anti-Dutch sentiment in England by demonstrating that all Englishmen were foreigners, a mixture of Scottish, Danish, Norwegian, and other races. The poem was very popular, particularly with King William, because it answered criticisms about his foreign birth. In 1701, Defoe increased his favor with the king by marching into Parliament and demanding it give the king the right to declare war on France. He might have risen high in the political ranks after that, but King William died after falling from a horse, and Queen Anne ascended the throne. Queen Anne's great interest was the Church of England, and Defoe, as a dissenter, now became an outsider. In 1702, a violent pamphlet war erupted between the Church of England and dissenting groups, leading to loud debates in Parliament. In the middle of this, Defoe released his famous pamphlet, the shortest was with dissenters, a pamphlet that attacked restriction on religious freedom, but that was unfortunately misunderstood. In this pamphlet, Defoe satirically suggests that all people who aren't members of the Church of England be destroyed, hanged, or banished. Members of the Church failed to see the irony and were outraged by its excessiveness. A reward of 50 pounds was posted for information that would lead to the arrest of Daniel Defoe. After four months as a fugitive, Defoe was captured and sent to prison. He was sentenced to the pillory, a wooden framework with holes to secure the head and hands, designed to expose the criminal to public abuse. Most people who were pilloried died as a result of rocks and other missiles hurled at their heads. Yet the people who came to see Daniel Defoe in disgrace didn't hurl missiles, they cheered. He'd written a satirical hymn to the pillory, which was circulated among the crowd and immediately won their support. Defoe was then shuffled back to prison, where he spent six more months. When he emerged, he was penniless and had no way to support his wife and eight children. He began publishing a political newspaper called The Review, which represented the views of the government. He had switched his political allegiance, and it wouldn't be the last time. For the following ten years, he wrote over a hundred pamphlets and books, while also writing The Review. Two of the most interesting of these included a fictionalized narrative of a true report about a woman who'd seen a ghost, and a 350-page poem in which Defoe argued against the divine right of kings. During this period, he also became a Secret Service agent, securing information for the government from his contacts all over England. He also spent some time as a spy, traveling through the country under the name of Alexander Goldsmith. When the war with France ended, the government changed, a new monarch took the throne, and Defoe's politics changed once again. He eventually became a secret worker for his former enemies. He had gone from Whig to Tory to Whig again, and when he was almost 60 years old, he finally gave up political writing and activities and turned to writing prose. It was then, in 1719, that Robinson Crusoe was born. During the following five years, he published other novels, including Captain Singleton, Moll Flanders, which is featured in our next Instant Expert session, and Roxana. As a writer, Defoe produced fiction that reflected the typical values of a man from the lower classes of the time, practicality, Protestant religious beliefs, and individual responsibility. For all his works, he's considered the father of the novel, as well as the father of English journalism. In his later years, Defoe again took up trading and again was unsuccessful. He formed a tile-making partnership that failed, and although he continued to write, 
his works lacked the strength of his earlier efforts. He had to use a pseudonym, Andrew Morton, to even get them published. The last days of Defoe's life were tragic. He was in hiding, even from his family, because of a creditor, and died alone in Ropemaker's Alley in 1731 at the age of 71. His final isolation was reminiscent of that of his most famous hero, Robinson Crusoe. It's now time for you to become acquainted with that hero and the strange and surprising adventures that catapulted him into international fame. There are only two main characters in Robinson Crusoe, and for much of the book there is only one. That one character is, of course, Crusoe himself. At the start of the book, Crusoe is a restless, impulsive young man with a desire to go to sea, but not much experience to back that desire. He nevertheless sets off on his own, in violation of his parents' wishes, and begins a series of adventures that lead only to repeated misfortune. As the story progresses, we begin to see that Crusoe is a very inventive and self-reliant man, and we also watch him develop spiritually from indifference to divine forces, to an absolute faith and dependence on them. The other main character in the story is Friday, an Indian who Crusoe adopts as his servant and successfully converts to Christianity. Friday is a loyal and helpful companion who eventually joins Crusoe in his escape from the island. When the story opens, young Robinson Crusoe has told his parents that his greatest wish is to go to sea, but his father strongly opposes the idea. He would like him to take up a middle-class trade and tells him the life of a sailor is filled with desperate chances. He tells his son that if he does this, God will not bless him, and when it is too late he will finally understand and regret not taking his father's counsel. But unaware of the risks he's taking, young Crusoe sets out on his voyage anyway. Now he reflects on that voyage in which the ship was caught in a terrible storm. He says, It was my advantage, in one respect, that I did not know what they meant by founder till I inquired. While the waves and wind battered the ship, Crusoe was so sick and frightened that he vows never again to leave solid ground if he is blessed enough to escape drowning. He's sure his suffering is God's punishment for having disobeyed his father. However, once he's safe on shore, he gets drunk with the other sailors and soon forgets his fears. In just a matter of hours, he's overcome again with a longing for the sea. He boards the ship a week later, and once again a storm occurs, even more violent than the first storm. The ship springs a leak, and the entire crew works to bail out the four feet of water in the hold. Finally, the ship sends out distress signals. Another ship passing by sends out a boat to help the crew escape. The crew is given money to return home, but Crusoe feels too embarrassed to face his family. Instead, he signs on with a ship headed for Africa. The captain advises him that it can be very profitable to buy items in London and sell them in Africa. On the voyage, Crusoe studies navigation and mathematics to improve his seafaring skills. He makes a good profit off the goods he sells, but when he returns home, the captain is dead. For safekeeping, Crusoe leaves his money with the captain's widow and then takes command of a second ship headed for Africa. On this second voyage to Africa, the ship and crew are captured by Turkish pirates. Crusoe is forced to become the slave of the pirate captain, but his thoughts from then on are always of escape. Whenever his master goes fishing, he takes Crusoe and a young slave boy named Jury with him. One day the captain has too much business and sends Crusoe and Jury out to fish alone. Crusoe escapes, taking the boy with him. They sail for five days before they head up a river along the coast. When a native swims out towards them, Crusoe scares him away by firing his gun. They wait for ten days on an island, hoping to catch sight of a European vessel, but none appears. Crusoe makes friends with the natives, and after shooting a leopard for them, is rewarded by gifts of corn, roots, and water. One day, Jury exclaims that he sees a ship with a sail. It's a Portuguese ship, probably bound for Africa, Crusoe thinks. He waves a flag and fires a shot, and the ship rescues him. The ship takes them to Brazil. The captain buys Crusoe's longboat, and he also buys Jury for use as a servant. Crusoe then sends to the widow for the money he left in England, and with the accumulated funds, he buys some land and establishes a sugar plantation. Three years later, he adds tobacco to his crop. The plantation prospers, but again he's restless and dissatisfied. He says prophetically that he lives like a man cast away on a desolate island, with nobody there but himself. So when he gets an offer for a position as a trader on a slave ship headed for Africa, he takes it. But before he leaves, he makes out a will. Half of his wealth is to be kept by the captain who saved him from the Turks, and the other half sent to England. He knows the voyage is unwise and risky, but he says... I was hurried on and obeyed blindly the dictates of my fancy rather than my reason. 
Eight years after he defiantly left the home of his parents, Crusoe's ship set sail. When a hurricane buffets the ship for twelve days, Crusoe decides to sail to Barbados to get some rest for the crew. He changes course, but a second storm arrives, pushing the ship far out of the sea lanes. Just as the crew member has yelled, Land! The ship runs aground on a sandbar. Because the ship is about to give way, the crew decides to abandon it and risk sailing towards the strange island ahead in spite of the storm raging around them. They pile into a boat and they begin to row and pray. An enormous wave engulfs the boat, scattering everyone into the water. Waves continue to crash over their heads, drowning each one of them except Crusoe. He's carried closer toward shore and is flung against a large rock which he clings to for safety. When he regains his strength, he makes a run for the shore. He scrambles up a grassy bank and is safe. Crusoe can't imagine how he survived, but he's grateful and he thanks God for his deliverance. Night is descending and he's afraid of wild beasts, so he sleeps in a tree. The next morning he sees that the ship has been lifted off the sandbar and is brought closer to shore. He decides to swim out and see what he can salvage. Once on board, Crusoe finds the food stores are still dry. He uses seven extra sails to make a light raft and hauls the food ashore, along with some tools, ammunition, two guns, and two rusty swords. Crusoe climbs a steep hill in search of a place to store his provisions, and from the top he sees he's on an island totally surrounded by the sea. No other land can be seen except some large rocks and two smaller islands to the west. The island seems uninhabited and barren. That night he builds a hut out of canvas and sea chests and falls asleep. The next morning he builds a second raft and totes more provisions to shore, more tools, bullets, muskets, bedding, a roll of sheet lead, and clothing. Over the next several days he makes this trip often, always returning with something else useful, including sugar, flour, bread, and barrels. On his last trip he finds a few forks and knives and some English money. At the sight of the money he delivers one of the most famous passages of the book. What art thou good for? Thou art not worth to me, no, not the taking off the ground. One of those knives is worth all this heap. I have no manner of use for thee. E'en remain where thou art and go to the bottom as a creature whose life is not worth saving. That night there is a storm that sinks the ship and his last remainder of civilization is gone forever. Now Crusoe turns his energy towards building more permanent shelter. He selects his site, a plain on the side of a rising hill, so nothing can approach him from the top. On the side of a rock is a hollow place, like an entrance to a cave. He uses sharp spikes to make a fence as a barricade around the shelter. He erects tents to cover and protect his provisions. Then he digs dirt out of the cave-like hole to use as a cellar. Crusoe then spends two weeks dividing his gunpowder into a hundred small parcels that he can hide in the cellar and holes in the rock. Each day he hunts for food. He discovers goats on the island and clambers up rocks behind them so he can shoot them without being detected. He begins to reflect on his fate, wondering why he alone was saved and feeling grateful for the provisions he was able to salvage. He knows that without the tools and ammunition, he would have been helpless. He concludes that all evils are to be considered with the good that is in them and with what worse attends them. To keep track of time, Crusoe builds a post and cuts a notch in it for every day that passes. Longer notches mark the Sabbath and the first day of a new month. Then he sets to work enlarging his cave, adding more entrances and exits, and making room for more supplies. He makes a table and a chair with boards he salvaged from the ship. When he needs new boards, he must cut down an entire tree and work laboriously with his simple tools until each side of the tree is flat. From one tree he gets only one board. Now we come to a new section of the novel. At this point, Crusoe begins to keep a journal, and from here on we are reading the entries in that journal. The diary reflects back on the first day, so many of the events we know are recounted again. The first entry begins, I, poor, miserable Robinson Crusoe, being shipwrecked, during a dreadful storm in the offing, came on shore on this dismal, unfortunate island, which I call the Island of Despair, all the rest of the ship's company being drowned and myself almost dead. Crusoe's journal is filled with the activities and inventions necessary to keep him alive and safe. He rescues a dog from the ship, and the dog accompanies him on his hunting expeditions. He thatches his house with large leaves. He makes shelves for the house. He labors long and hard to try and make a cask, but is unable to fit the staves together properly. He saves the tallow from the goats he kills to fashion a sort of candle. At one point, Crusoe discovers a bag of seeds from his salvaged goods that have been partially eaten by rats. 
He tosses the seeds away and discovers a few weeks later that barley is growing near his house. First he thinks that barley is a miracle of God. When he remembers the moldy seeds he tossed, he still believes it's God's providence because they landed in the shade of a high rock where they were protected from the deadly sun. Crusoe saves this crop and sows a crop each year, not allowing himself to eat any until the fourth year. After an earthquake and hurricane threaten his cave, Crusoe decides he must find a stronger home. He decides he will search for a better site as soon as he can. Meanwhile, he makes his trips back and forth to the wrecked ship. He obtains enough beams and planks to make a good ship, but he doesn't know how to build one. On a cold, rainy June day, Crusoe becomes ill with fever and head pains. For a week, his condition worsens until he's too weak to even stand up. He begs the Lord for pity and mercy, then falls asleep and dreams of being approached by a man with a spear who says, Seeing all these things has not brought thee to repentance. Now thou shalt die. Crusoe is distressed by the dream, feeling it's God's justice for his willfulness, and he begs for God to help him. He recovers soon after and meditates on the beach about what God has destined for him. He feels his isolation is punishment. He finds a Bible among his supplies and opens it to the passage, Call on me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee. Crusoe prays with sincerity for the first time in his life. Now Crusoe sets out to explore the island further. He finds rich plains of tobacco, grapes, citrus trees, and other plants. He decides to keep a shelter near the shore, where he can spot passing ships. But he builds a bower in the plains, which he calls his summer house. The rainy seasons are heavy and seemingly endless. Crusoe stays inside and makes baskets from twigs. He wishes he had a pipe to smoke. When the rains pass, he decides to explore the whole island. He finds hares, turtles, goats, and pigeons. He brings a parrot back with him and teaches it to talk. The years pass and now his spiritual values have changed dramatically. He reads the Bible daily and finds solace in its statement that God will never leave or forsake him. After he reads, he hunts. Then he perseveres and cooks what he's caught. And then he works with his simple tools. It is difficult work. It takes him 42 days just to make one board for a shelf. He domesticates the goats and builds a fence around them. He spends many days trying to make clay pots out of homemade paste. He labors hard to plant his crops using a tree branch as a rake and plow. His clothes are wearing thin, so he makes new ones from animal skins. While he's working, Crusoe is always thinking of a means of escape. He chops down a cedar tree to make a boat, but after spending three months clearing the inside of it, he finds it's too heavy for him to roll to the sea. He considers building a canal to the boat, but decides it would take about twelve years to complete it, so he abandons the plan. When he's not thinking of escape, he ponders his life and how dreadful it's been, and decides the life of a sailor is, in his words, destitute of the knowledge of God. The years continue to pass, and Crusoe now lives comfortably. He is also a changed man. He says, I looked now upon the civilized world as a thing remote, which I had nothing to do with, no expectation from, and indeed no desires about. He builds a small canoe and sets out on small cruises around the island. On one of these cruises, the currents begin to carry him out to sea, and he becomes desperate, unable to turn the boat back towards the island. But after a sudden change in the current and the wind brings him back to safety, he again thanks God for his deliverance. One afternoon when Crusoe is headed for his boat, he sees a man's footprint on the beach. He's terrified. He can see the print is larger than his, and wonders if the devil himself put it there to torment him. Then he imagines there might be natives nearby. He builds another wall around his house and places his guns in holes to defend himself. He writes, Fear of danger is ten thousand times more terrifying than danger itself. Two years pass and no other sign of man is seen, but he lives in constant fear. Then one day he thinks he sees a boat on the sea. He climbs down his hill to the shore and sees a terrible sight. The beach is covered with human skulls, hands, feet, and other bones. He also sees a circle in the earth where there had been a fire and where, as he says, the savage wretches had set down their inhuman feastings upon the bodies of their fellow creatures. For the next two years, Crusoe keeps himself hidden, afraid the cannibals will return. He becomes obsessed with how he can destroy these savages and save any victims they might bring back in the future. He loads all his guns and makes regular expeditions to the top of the hill to look for them. Then he begins to doubt his plan. After all, the natives don't have the same moral code as civilized men and he thinks about how ruthless the Spanish were in killing the natives they conquered in South America. In his twenty-third year on the island, Crusoe sees a light on the shore two miles away. 
he approaches and sees nine savages sitting around a fire, waiting for the tides to change so they can return to their canoe. When they leave, he finds more human bones, evidence of another cannibalistic feast. The following year, there is a great storm, and from his shelter, Crusoe hears the sound of guns being fired. He runs to the top of the hill and sees a ship has been wrecked. He is excited to think some of the men may have been saved, but it's not to be. Days later, only a corpse washes up on the shore. In its pocket, he finds a pipe. Crusoe sails out to the wrecked ship, which turns out to be Spanish. He takes back with him more supplies, including two kettles, a pot, and several chests. The chests contain only clothes and money, neither of which he can use. Months later, Crusoe is surprised to see five canoes on the shore. With his spyglass, he can see thirty men below. They are dancing around a fire, and they have two captive natives with them. One is immediately clubbed to death, and the other breaks free and runs down the beach in Crusoe's direction. Crusoe grabs his gun and chases the man's pursuers away, killing one in the process. The native he saved falls to his knees, kisses the ground, and then takes Crusoe's foot and places it on his head, his way of swearing allegiance for life. Crusoe takes him back to his cave. Crusoe christens the native Friday in member of the day in which he saved his life. He describes Friday as a comely, handsome fellow, perfectly well-made, with straight, strong limbs and not too large, tall and well-shaped, and as I reckon, about twenty-six years of age. He tells Friday to call him Master and begins to teach him English. Friday later tells him that there had been a great battle between the natives and he'd been taken prisoner. Crusoe dresses Friday in some of his animal skin clothing and at first sleeps with his weapons nearby. But he soon learns that Friday is loving and faithful and that he has nothing to fear. Friday is also a quick learner and helps Crusoe with all his tasks, including the hunting. Friday thinks the gun is a magical person and he talks to it. From Friday, Crusoe learns that the natives usually visit the other side of his island but a current had brought them that one morning to his side. He also learns that the island to the west of him is Trinidad. He figures they're fairly close to South America, and Friday estimates that two men in a canoe could reach the continent safely, a proposition that fills Crusoe with excitement. Crusoe teaches Friday Christianity, and the native becomes such an exemplary Christian that Crusoe says, I have known few equal to him in my life. In his 27th year on the island, Crusoe builds a new canoe with the help of Friday, with which they hope to sail to Friday's island. Friday says there are about 17 men there, rescued from a wrecked Spanish or Portuguese ship. Crusoe thinks these men may be his ticket home. But one morning, Friday comes rushing up from the shore, yelling that three canoes have landed below. Crusoe resolves to fight, and Friday agrees to join him. They take their guns and ammunition and find about 21 natives with three prisoners. One of the prisoners is white. Crusoe and Friday open fire, killing many of the natives and then they storm down the beach, firing on the rest. Only four escape, and the rest are killed. When Friday takes a look at one of the prisoners, he begins to leap and dance for joy. It's his father. The white man turns out to be a Spaniard, who tells Crusoe there are about 16 other Spaniards and Portuguese living on a nearby island, just as Friday had said. In the next six months, the men build a boat. Friday's father and the Spaniards set out to rescue the 16 men. All those who will swear allegiance to Crusoe will be permitted to return to his island. Eight days later, Crusoe sees an English ship anchored at sea and a small boat making its way to the island. There are eleven men and three are tied up as prisoners. The prisoners are beaten by the others. Then, as they wait for the tide to come in, they set out to explore the island. Friday and Crusoe arm themselves and approach the prisoners, now left alone. One of them tells them he is captain of the ship and the others have mutinied against him. Crusoe promises to help them on two conditions. While they're on the island, they are in his command and must surrender any weapons to him. And if the ship is recovered, they must take him to England. The prisoners agree, and Crusoe gives them muskets. When the mutineers return, the prisoners open fire, killing two of them and taking the others captive. The captives surrender to Crusoe, who is now called governor. When Crusoe realizes the ship has been taken, he's speechless. He's finally free to leave the island. He writes... Such was the flood of joy in my breast that it put all my spirits into confusion. At last I broke out into tears, and in a little while after I recovered my speech. The worst of the mutineers are left on the island. They prefer this to returning to England to be hanged. Crusoe gives them a few tips about surviving on the island, and then he takes his parrot and boards the ship. He leaves the island after twenty-seven years, two months, and nineteen days of captivity. When he arrives back in England, he has been gone for thirty-five years. When Crusoe arrives home, his mother and father are dead, and he himself has been believed dead by his brother and sisters. 
The owner of the ship he rescued from the mutineers gives him a large sum of money as thanks. Crusoe journeys to Lisbon for news of his holdings in Brazil and discovers that his plantation has flourished and he now owns over 5,000 pounds in British sterling. He sends money to charities, to the widow of the captain, and to his sisters. Crusoe and Friday head back for London overland. Crusoe is afraid to return by sea. A snowstorm interrupts their travels, and then three wolves and a bear rush out at them from the woods. Friday shoots one wolf, causing the other to flee in terror. Then he manages to shoot the bear by first enticing it up a tree where he can get a good mark on it. They continue on their journey and halfway cross the plain. They see over a hundred wolves charging them. They open fire and the wolves stop, terrified. Then they start yelling because Crusoe has heard that wolves fear the sound of a man's voice. The wolves retreat into the woods. The men ride on, but are soon attacked by even more wolves, three hundred this time. They hide behind some fallen trees and ward off the attack, killing as many as sixty wolves in the process. Finally, they reach the safety of a village, and from there they make their way to London. Crusoe sells his plantation. He marries and has three children. But his wife dies, and he's compelled to join his nephews on a voyage to the East Indies. Crusoe revisits his island and discovers the mutineers have taken native wives. He leaves them supplies and furnishes them with a carpenter and a smith. The ship then sails around the Cape of Good Hope to China. He takes an overland trip through Siberia and back to England. Upon this return, he's been abroad a total of 54 years and is now an old, weathered man, living out his remaining days peacefully and never taking to the sea again. At the end of Robinson Crusoe, the hero has found peace, but in reality that peace was won many years before on the island when he reconciled himself to his fate and accepted and resigned himself to the will of God. This is the strongest message of Defoe's novel and is in fact a message he promotes in almost all his fictional writing. Defoe was an ardent believer in God and he also believed that all adversity and obstacles were part of a divine plan for inner growth. It is God's providence that designs the unusual and often arduous circumstances that man finds himself in, and this providence has a specific purpose. That is why Crusoe interprets the storm and his banishment to the island as punishment. He had refused to listen to his father's advice, which was sound advice based on solid middle-class values. Defoe admired the middle class, and his hero had made the mistake of showing disrespect for the values of the middle class, including family, career, and social order. It was, in effect, a defiance of God and providence. He had refused to accept his station and role in life, and had supposed his will could supersede the will of God. The middle class is given a special spiritual role in the book, particularly through the words of Crusoe's father, who says, Give me neither poverty or riches. Feed me with food convenient to me, lest I be full and deny thee, and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal, and take the name of God in vain. But Defoe believes that man is basically sinful and can't be happy with a simple and virtuous life. So Robinson Crusoe sets out after adventures and wealth and is stranded on an island with only God for company. Now he must learn to be happy in the place that God and nature has chosen for him. He has no choice but to accept his destiny, and so he does. Crusoe responds by repenting and by becoming more and more reliant on God. This supplies him with the strength and serenity to endure under incredibly adverse circumstances. Certainly he has the skills and self-sufficiency to endure on a physical level. He demonstrates all the qualities of inventiveness, resourcefulness, and practicality that Englishmen of the time so prided themselves on. But without his deepening faith, it's unlikely his mental and emotional health would have survived, however well he provided for his body. The pattern of divine providence is introduced early in the book, and is developed throughout the story. First, Crusoe ignores his father's wishes and rebels against his station in life. Thus, his first voyage is marred by a terrible storm. Then he decides to pursue the sea as a career and is captured by Turkish pirates and enslaved. Then he persists in his choice of a seafaring life and his ship is wrecked and he's marooned on a deserted island. Every step of the way, when he defies his destiny, he is ruined. However, when he is on the island and begins to accept his destiny and to bow to the will of God, he is rescued over and over. He is saved from storms, earthquakes, currents, fevers, and natives, not just because he calls on God for help, but because he truly believes that he's reliant on God and that all events and circumstances are a result of divine will. To Defoe, the perfect life was the life of acceptance, acceptance of God and acceptance of one's life. In our next session, We'll take a look at another of Defoe's novels, but this time it is a young woman who challenges her destiny 
and whose adventures delighted and intrigued the readers of 18th century England as much as they do readers today. This is the end of the session.